Welcome everyone to the first session of Scheller Lunchtime Live, a new live stream series hosted by the Georgia Tech Scheller College of Business. My name is Lindsay Kane, and I'm the Associate Director of Client Relationships for non-degree executive education programs. On select Fridays at 12 p.m., you'll have the chance to hear from Scheller faculty, student, and alumni speakers as they discuss relevant topics for the tech-driven digital age. At Scheller, we're proud to offer undergraduate, MBA, and PhD programs, along with open enrollment and custom executive education programs. It's my pleasure to introduce David Sluss, a professor of organizational behavior who researches and educates high potential professionals to become agile, adaptive, and analytical leaders through creating personalized and productive work relationships. He focuses on new leader development and transitions, as well as building leader resilience in the face of adversity. He takes a diagnostic and behavioral approach to facilitating leadership development. Professor Sless has published research in premier academic journals and outlets, such as Harvard Business Review, and works with organizations on both relevant research efforts, as well as executive education solutions throughout the US, Latin America, and Europe. Today, Professor Sluss will be speaking to us about how to build people, broaden others' perspectives, and boost your own patience for more resilient virtual teams. Turning it over to you, David. Thank you, Lindsay, for the introduction. I'm really excited and honored to be the inaugural uh, speaker on this series. And let me start sharing my screen here. Um, and then we can allow that to... Paul, you can help us out. Awesome. So. Again, honored to be here to talk to you about leading virtual resilience. We're going to talk about three main components, people, perspective, and patience, as we think about leading others with resilience. Um, as we think about what we've been going through for, gosh, eight, nine months now, uh, we can think about some headlines we probably see and sort of think about how you might be feeling as we see these headlines together. We have this idea of coronavirus latest, North Carolina and Illinois report daily record jumps in COVID cases is from a couple of weeks ago. Um, more states break COVID-19 records as some hospitals start to running low on space, and that's increasingly in the second surge we're going through. Uh, Merkel in Germany warns of a long, hard winter as lockdowns return. And lastly, something we've all been experiencing for quite a bit of time, the coronavirus is creating a huge stressful experiment in working from home. So as you think about how we feel individually, we probably can think, oh, our heart rate is going up a little bit. We're feeling a little bit anxious, a little bit stressed, possibly um, distracted uh, with, with these uh, different things going through our minds. So as we think about this, then we, at the individual level, we can do some breathing, just simple breathing to relax. Um, we know from years of research around mindfulness that this helps us reduce our stress, reduce our anxiety, helps us deal with the situation in front of us. What we're gonna do metaphorically today is as a leader, what are some of the techniques and strategies we can use to help our team breathe better and therefore be able to be more resilient and deal with the crisis at hand. So what is resilience? Well, resilience is the capacity to respond calmly, consistently and constructively in a crisis. In a sense, it's bouncing back plus, where we're bouncing back from the current adversity, but as we go through this adversity and crisis, we're learning things that help us in the next one. So we're bouncing back, plus we're more apt to be able to deal with things in the future. So resilience will build capacity during this crisis that can be activated in the next one. And yes, the reality is there will be a next one. Um, there will always be crises that we, adversities we have to deal with. So how to lead these, how to lead teams around resilience, then we wanna look at people perspective and patience, the first component being the people. So we, felt we have, need to figure out where are they currently? Where is their current level of resilience? What are we dealing with? What's our sort of raw materials that we're gonna deal with as a team? And then engage in resilience-based conversations to be able to help start building that resilience. So years of research from multiple different literatures in psychology and addiction recovery and rehabilitative services, that deal with all different types of adversity. They've done studies of studies, which we call meta-analyses, and they find that there's three main protective or facilitative factors that allow folks to be resilient, self-efficacy, support, and structure. So thinking about our current adversity and working from home and 
deal with the pandemic and all the other things going on, we have this idea of, okay, are our folks, do they have confidence in their own abilities? That's going to give them a certain baseline level of resilience. How about support? Do the, do the folks have social and familiar resources? Do they have social competence? They can make friends easily. And, and this is even more important as we're working from home. Do they have this competence to reach out and create support for themselves? And then finally, structure. It's interesting, this last question, a lot of people will ask me, well, did, was this created just because of the pandemic and working from home? It's like, no, this is a, a enduring protective or facilitative factor to be able to build resilience around, do your folks have discipline routines for personally structuring their work? As I was interviewing folks at the beginning of the lockdown and the beginning of the pandemic in the US, an attorney reported to us how a managing partner went around to everyone in the firm and asked around the support, right? So do they take care of any elderly, at-risk people at home? Do they need to actually, this is before people were really starting to work from home, do you need to go ahead and shift your work towards home? And then they adjusted and reprioritized caseloads. So as we think about getting to know our people, there's a very highly scientific method, I'm saying this somewhat tongue in cheek, of how we can figure out where they're at with these three levels. It's very simple, we ask them, right? So as we think about this, then we're, we're looking we're looking at, okay, how do we think about it at the team level? We start asking these folks, well, we can start filling in what I would call is a dashboard, a resilience dashboard. So here's an example here. Um, so we have Rashid, Leslie, James, and Sandra, right? So let's say you're leading these four folks and you're, you're getting the information from them. You're observing what's going on. You say Rashid is, is green. Green is they're good to go. Yellow is they, they need probably some support. We need to keep an eye on it. And red is they definitely need some help here. And so we have Rashid green and green on self-efficacy and support. We're yellow on structure. Leslie is red on self-efficacy, uh, yellow on support. James is yellow on self-efficacy, but we need to figure out what's going on with support. And Sanders, all green to go. And Sanders probably all green to go. Sanders, my sister's name, and I think she's pretty cool. Um, so as we think about this as a leader, we could start getting pretty stressed and saying, gosh, okay, now I need to go talk to Rashid. I need to talk to Leslie. I need to talk to James. All these other things going on. That's true. You could do that as a leader. You could sort of pop in and, and be um, the, the knight in shining armor, if you will. But there's, I think, a better way and will actually build resilience for your team based on this dashboard. Why not make developmental assignments of those that are good on the greens, on, on green, some of these, uh, some of these uh, factors and be able to help those that are struggling. So for example, here's just an example. Leslie, you could ask Leslie, give a development assignment for Leslie to go help Rashid around structure. Now, what's the benefit from this? Well, obviously Rashid is possibly getting some help Maybe Rashid has made that transition to home, uh, working from home not as smoothly as Leslie has. You're asking Leslie to go out and reach out to Rashid and, and help out here. Now, the side benefit for Leslie is as Leslie is being asked to do this, all of a sudden now Leslie's confidence, self-efficacy might go up. Leslie is creating a connection with Rashid different than in the past and might also create some support for Leslie. So as you do these simple developmental assignments, you're actually going to increase the resilience of the team overall. Another way you could think, well, Sandra, she's naturally resilient. We just leave her alone. Well, no, we could ask Sandra to go and talk to James and about asking and observe, um, around support, getting some feedback from James as to where James is as to support. Now, as to the Sandras of the world, we also wanna be careful about the naturally resilient. Don't ignore them, first of all. You think, oh, they're good. I'm just going to leave them to the side. Um, whereas here we want to think about there's two things that could be happening. The first you might have seen more at the beginning of the pandemic, and you might see the result of that now, which is those that are all green might panic work. Just like we were panic buying, we're going out and buying all the toilet paper uh, known to man uh, kind, is that panic work, that Sandra's of the world, the naturally resilient, they have high self-efficacy, they have, have high support, they have high structure, they want certainty, they're gonna dig in and do things, but they might just be spinning, 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 and it cre can create some burnout. The other side of the coin 
is those that are um, highly resilient at times may not understand very well um, those that aren't as highly resilient and therefore be seen as more cold or not compassionate. So a question you can ask yourself to when you have all greens on your list and your dashboard is, are they understanding of others? Do I need to possibly help them around the compassion issue? So once we know them, now we're gonna make these developmental assignments. Is there a formula? Is there an agenda we could give them? Well, there is. So let me talk to you about some research I did with the US Navy looking at newcomers. And here we have um, newcomers coming into the Navy. It's a tough experience. Anyone that's gone through basic training in the military, whatever country you might be from, it's a tough experience. And here, as, as the Navy was very interested in helping the recruits build resilience so that once they get out to the fleet, they're more apt to deal with the adversity and the trials and tribulations out there. Then we were looking at trying to do some interventions during basic training that would increase their resilience. And what we did, we, we looked at a lot of research and we found that professional coaches is one of those interventions that had the highest effect, efficacy rate. But we said, well, do they really need to be professional? Can we give other recruits some guidance and they can have a conversation in recruit pairs, sharing peak experiences, comparing strategies for challenges and their future identity as a Navy sailor. What you see on the right hand of the screen here is great results. This intervention, everything else being held um, equal. So this was a, it was a, in a sense a quasi or control experiment in the field. As you can see a great increase just from this simple conversation they had for 20 minutes with another recruit. So translating that into the work into the workspace, how could you engage in resilience-based conversations? Well, similar to the dashboard, you probably want to don't want to do this yourself. You want to assign this out to having virtual meetups especially as we work from home, just having that connection, giving them a little bit of agenda doesn't have to be too structured, but have them talk about positive current work experiences, challenges and how they're overcoming them, dealing with them. And lastly, learning from the now to the new normal. What, what are things gonna look like for them as we start picturing what the new normal might be? So as we know our people and we can engage in resilience-based conversations, we might start noticing that their ability to broadly see what's going on might be constrained. We know from also years of psychological research that as we're under lots of pressure and stress, we will start narrowing down our view. We'll start not seeing all the options available to us. For those listening, maybe some of them are currently in this experience, but you might reflect on your days as a poor college student when you had 20 days left in the month and only 15 days of money left and your ability to see options start getting more and more constrained. And you had some friend come along and say, well, why don't you think about this? And you're like, aha, right? So sometimes just having those outside perspectives. So how we can do this as a leader is we want to ask some perspective broadening questions. So the first way we can do this is a little bit counterintuitive. Here we're asking questions that actually sort of double down on the adversity where we're facing down the reality. We're asking them, what plans do you have in place to work remotely longer than anticipated or fill in a different role in the new normal or whatever change you might see coming down the pike? Where this came from is from, it's called the Stockdale Paradox. Um, James Stockdale, he was a prisoner of war from the US Navy during the Vietnam War. And he was asked a very insightful question. He said, as you think about those that died of natural causes, not because of the prisoner of war experience, but just natural causes seemingly, what was, what's the distinguishing factor? And he said, oh, that's easy, the optimists. So let's think about this. Um, think about it, what we might have been thinking about in May of this year of when the pandemic would end. And think about this quote. Oh, they were the ones who said, we're gonna be out by Christmas. And Christmas would come and Christmas would go and they'd say, we're going to be out by Easter. And Easter would come and Easter would go. And then Thanksgiving and then Christmas again. And they died of a broken heart. This is a very important lesson. You must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose, with discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. So as leaders, we can help people 
broaden their perspective by asking these questions that face down reality, help them accept that reality. And then they can start thinking through, well, yeah, what would I do if I need to work longer? If, if I'm a professor and it's the spring and I'm thinking, gosh, what would I do need to do if I'm teaching hybrid in the fall? Maybe I'll start preparing for that in the summer, um, which is autobiographical for some of us. The next type of question we might wanna ask is around collaborating questions. So this is the fun questions to ask. As leaders, you'll have people come to you with, hey, I need help here. So getting them to perspective broaden and find support is just asking this simple question, who on your team, within the organization, within the network might be able to help you on this challenge. <clears throat> so this is what I would see as the resilience fuel. It reminds them of the social support that's available to them. Now, the last part as we get into our last minutes together is around patience. So we've talked about knowing our people, we build a dashboard, we create developmental assignments, we get them engaging in resilience-based conversations. We, we start asking perspective broadening questions, we're finding opportunities within the crisis to learn. Now it comes to us. Are we gonna be able to be patient with everyone else as we go through this process? So first, what is patience? And then we'll talk about one particular patience booster that I hope will change your view of how you can be more patient. It might not be exactly what you think. So patience, the way I would like to define it is taking a little bit from uh, the field of positive psychology and changing it just a smidgen, which is it's a propensity to act calmly in the face of frustration or adversity. It's defined in the literature as waiting calmly. However, as I think about patience, patience isn't just sitting on our hands. And in fact, there's lots of research that would say, if we continue to just wait calmly and sit and sit and sit and sit, and some of you might actually be responding currently inside going, will he stop saying sit, sit, sit over again? And you sort of dive in and you might in the end act less calmly than you should have because you were waiting quote unquote too long. So I like to reframe it as it's a propensity to act calmly in the face of frustration. So there's different types of patients and personal patients, life's hardship patients, daily hassles, and COVID-19 crisis, work from home, social and racial injustice, all have punched up all three of these to the max. Now, just a real quick, I think we anecdotally can agree that patience is important. But let, let me share some data that show how it's, in patience for how it's important for leaders. So as we think about patience in this way, that leader is patience with others. If, they have, if other people are having difficulty learning something new, they're going to help them out without getting frustrated or annoyed. The leader is, stays calm when things get tough. So as I thought about that idea, I said, okay, well, leaders need to be visionary. They need to be somewhat future focused. They also need to facilitate and, and have consensus-based decision-making approaches. So we know that those two main approaches are really positive. Well, what happens if we interact that with patients? What happens when there's low patients? What happens when there's high patients? From about 600 professionals that I surveyed, you can see here that it's really powerful, where in a sense, only when the leader was patient, did those effective leadership approaches such as being a futurist or being a facilitator really mattered for creativity and collaboration and productivity with these professionals. So now that we know patience is important, let's think about our own level of patience. How can we boost it up? So the one patience booster I want to talk about is something I've got a lot of feedback from folks around, so I want to share it with you guys, is refraining the, reframing the meaning of speed. So again, patience is acting calmly in the face of adversity. It's not waiting calmly, it's acting calmly. So we're gonna reframe also the meaning of speed. So Google, for example, go slow to go fast. US Navy has made a very, saying very popular from Aikido, uh, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. This idea of being strategically fast. So we don't wanna confuse moving quickly with strategic speed, which is reducing the time it takes to deliver value. An example of this from interviews that I've done, an actuary or a statistician mentioned that the manager, and that manager was a car buff, stated that accuracy was the nitro booster for their work speed. So they should be ultra careful, which means at times possibly going slower at times 
to go faster in the long run, to avoid slowdowns later. So in a sense, what you're doing is you're changing out your stopwatch for a compass. Now, what does this look like during the pandemic? So again, going back to interviews we've done at an engineering research firm, a manager, um, this is a professional reporting on that manager saying, my manager has demonstrated patience by understanding that each individual contributor is dealing with personal hardships during this time. Our work remains a priority in my job. However, my manager has specifically allowed each contributor to speak with him one-on-one -on -one to address any concerns. And he has allowed us to relax some deadlines and constraints. As I've shared this example with others that a lot of people will hone in on, very rightly so, how the manager took time during such a chaotic time to have one-on-ones with each person. Now that's important. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. Where I see the insight here, maybe some of you see it too, is that we didn't slow down on everything. So patience doesn't mean you go, oh, there's a crisis. We're going to slow down everything. What it actually means is let's see what are some of the constraints we actually need to still stick to and what are some of the deadlines and constraints that we're going to relax. So again, we're being strategically fast. We're slowing down to go fast, smooth, um, is fast. Now, as we move into the last couple of minutes here together, um, I just want to thank you for your time and all the comments I've sort of been um, eyeing as you go along. And so there might be some really juicy questions in here that we want to deal with. So if we could bring Lindsay back to us and Lindsay's going to pull out some of the questions that we might want to be able to answer in the last couple of minutes we have together. Excellent. Thanks. So there was a really great question, um, especially in the environments where we're wearing masks and it makes it harder to read verbal cues. Mm. Help, help folks manage those nonverbal signals that reflect patients authentically. Ah, OK. Um, all right. So not to wax too poetic, um, but the eyes are the window to the soul. Right. So if we look at research on micro expressions, so some of you might have actually watched a somewhat popular TV show years back called Lie to Me. It's built on this research that was done around micro expressions. And for example, when we smile and it's a true smile, we are also smiling with our eyes. So there's a lot to be still captured up here in our eyes and, and so forth. So that's take number one, I would say is if you're trying to express that, make sure you can't do the fake smiles with the mask because what's coming across in the eyes is still, I'm still upset. So get yourself right internally possibly before you go engage with them or go ahead and verbally say, you know, I'm pretty stressed about this. I don't want to be, let's talk about it. That's actually acting calmly in the face of adversity. Take number two is if you're in an environment that you're back at work and you're working, but you have to be with masks, is it actually possible to have your meeting, your, engage, your your conversation in a way that it's possibly, oh my goodness, heaven forbid, say on Zoom while you're still in the same building, but you can take off the mask and have the full verbals or the full nonverbals in front of you. That would be my two ways of, of, of thinking about that question. Cool question, love it. Thank you. Um, so there was another question around self-assessments that folks can take to figure out if they're suffering from adverse, uh, adverse adversity, sorry, mm -hmm. or, um, you know, trying to hone in on skills, but don't really know how to deal with it. And there may be some challenges in admitting it to anyone at work. Um, do you have any thoughts around that? Yes. Yeah, so, so there, as we talk about doing this dashboard, right? So, um, you can, in a sense, turn the questions to them. Um, there, there is a, um, and we can find a way to put it onto LinkedIn it's, and I'll, we can make it accessible. There's a simple nine question survey that one can take self-assessment gets at their own level of self-efficacy of social support um, that they have and, and structure. So as a self-assessment allows them to more personally deal with that. Thank you. Well, I think aside from those really two juicy questions, a lot of kudos. I know you have some former students on the call and some current students who yeah. are 
in the midst of having their finals graded right now. So shout out to those students <laughs> on the line. I'm well. going right back to grading them as soon as I'm done with this. Okay, I promise. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much, David. Um, our thank next you. lunchtime live session will be on Friday, January 15th at 12 p.m. Eastern. The topic will be Me, Myself, and I, a conversation about narcissism in the workplace featuring Professor Katie Badura. You can register for this event and learn more about the spring 2021 Scheller Lunchtime Live lineup by following the Georgia Tech Scheller College of Business on LinkedIn. A recording of this session and future sessions will be available on our page as well. Thanks so much for joining. Thanks, David. Thank you.